opportunity to be here and to worship you, the great and holy and wonderful God, the God who has all power and who does amazing things, Father, that you, as we just sang, Father, you take the worst things and can turn them into good. You turn garbage into gold, and we're just so grateful for that, Father. God, we ask that as we come today, as we bring whatever it is that we have to bring before you, Father, the the challenges of our life, the troubles that we face, our mistakes, all the things, as we lay those at your feet, Father, you're able to take those things and to work good out of them and through them, Father. And so we just ask in this this time that you'd help us, Father, to connect with you, to be close to you, to hear your wisdom, and help us to respond in the way that you want us to. As your spirit speaks to us through your word, Father, help us to listen closely and to respond. We love you. We are so grateful for this opportunity. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. You can have a seat. Good morning. Good morning Welcome to church. Good morning, Doug. <laughs> I always appreciate the big good morning. It's really good to be here with you guys. I'm so glad that you're here, that we get to have church together. And today, we are kicking off some really exciting things for the summer ahead. You know, I know it doesn't feel like summer outside. It's actually kind of nice. But we are excited to be kicking off the summer as a church. And we've got a few big things that I want to let you know about. First off, tonight is The Forge. Men, be here. It's going to be a great opportunity for us to grow in our leadership, for us to grow together in our relationships. Seriously, you don't want to miss it. And I love that when I announce something to guys, I don't have to be fluffy about it. Be there. It's going to be good. Okay, the next thing I wanna let you know about is this Thursday at 6 p.m. This is for everybody. It's called Midweek. And Midweek is a Bible study, and it's gonna be a great opportunity for everyone that's here in this room Thursday night at 6 p.m. to dig into God's word. We're gonna have a Bible study together. We're gonna build relationships with each other. And I'm gonna give you what I'm calling pointers for powerful Bible study. So in just a minute, for example, in just a minute, Pastor Tim is gonna share from Micah 6, 8, and we're all gonna get really incredible insight from this passage. It's gonna be extremely helpful. You should be able to get that same amount of insight out of God's word yourself in your own personal Bible study. And I think if you're a part of Midweek with us, it'll help you take some steps in getting there so that we can really get as much as we possibly can out of God's word. And so we want to equip you and encourage you to do that. That's what Midweek is really all about. And we're going to do it in a way that also helps us build relationships with each other. So that's Midweek, this Thursday at 6 p.m. I want you to be there with me. And it would be super helpful for me if you'd let me know that you're coming. And so I want to encourage you today, if you plan on being there, use this Connect card. There's a little spot on the back that says, sign me up for blank. You can write in midweek or Bible study. Either way, I'll get that. I'll know that you're coming. That way I can be prepared for you. Does that sound good? Today, we're also kicking off our new message series called Summer Collection. 
And what this is, is every week we're gonna be diving deep into a particular passage of scripture that we believe God wants us to focus on as a church this summer. We want these to be passages of scripture that come to define us as people and as a church. And so to help us get started with that, let's welcome Pastor Tim. All right. Thank you, Brian. Good morning, everybody. Great to be with you. Great start to our summer series. I am excited to be kicking it off. I want to start with just a question. Has anyone ever started a project to only get to the end of the project and to realize that you had missed a crucial step along the way? Has anyone ever been there? All right. So at one point, all four of our kids were in one bedroom, which meant that we had to build up when it comes to their sleeping arrangements. So naturally, we go down to Ikea, we pick up one of these. Now, if you are a parent, you already know what this is. You understand very well the dark, deep place that I was about to have to go to in order to put this thing together. See, the Ikea bunk bed is a modern marvel of construction engineering. I mean, it is compact, it's economical, it's space-saving, it's kid-friendly, but there's just one really big problem. It doesn't come like that. It comes in a box with more parts in it than I believe God used to create the earth. And it's so tightly packed in there You're wondering if you're going to have to call reinforcements just to get it out of there. I mean, even the guys that developed Tetris were like, nice. (laughs) And then the instructions. Guys, the instructions. The instructions are a piece of paper with a picture of the bunk bed and like a thousand lines showing where every bolt and screw and part goes. And somehow... With my magic wand, I am supposed to create a bunk bed out of this. (laughs) Anyway, so we get started on this. And and somewhere around hour 10 into this project, uh, I feel like victory is close at hand. I mean, I feel like I'm getting close to finishing this thing. I'm going to make it without having to take any more PTO days. And I I get my last piece. I go to put it onto the bunk bed, and it doesn't fit. I mean, I tried flipping it over. I tried turning around. I'm going forwards. I'm going backwards. I cannot get the holes to line up this thing. I have made a mistake. And this, this is when the darkness <laughs> began closing in, <laughs> right? Emotions that I had not felt since puberty began resurfacing. I wanted to cry. I wanted to quit. I wanted to throw the whole thing out. I just wanted to walk away. But I know that I couldn't do it right? I had a wife that was trusting me. I had a family that was depending on me. I had kids that wanted a place to sleep. I was the husband, the dad. I was the victorious champion of my tribe. I had to rise above this challenge and frustration, and I had to finish. So that's when I went into the garage and grabbed some three-inch deck screws, and I fixed it (laughs) like a man. Okay, I'm exaggerating. They're only two and a half inch deck screws. Um, <laughs> okay, I'm exaggerating a little bit to make my point, but I think we all understand here is I had signed on to make a bed for my kids and I was committed to that. I was devoted to that. I, I was going to make it happen, but I was also wrong, right? I had gotten distracted. I had missed a step. I had focused on the wrong thing. Stephen Covey has a quote where he says, if the ladder is not leaning against the right wall, Every step that we take just gets us to the wrong place faster. See, in our relationship with God, we can desire really good things. We can desire things that are really good and pure, but we can easily get distracted. We can can get distracted and focused on the wrong things. And because of that, we end up going to the wrong places. Now, in the Old Testament, there's a story about a prophet named Micah. Micah spoke to God's people about the fact that even though they would say they were devoted to God, they were going about it all the wrong ways. They were religious, but they were not righteous. Their ladder was leaning up against the wrong wall. Now, because of that, God sent Micah to warn them and to reveal to them that they needed to change in order to avoid God's judgment that was gonna come their way. In Micah's words, they're, they're just as applicable to us today as they were when he originally spoke them. 
See, God clearly tells us what to do in order to experience his blessings. He tells us what to focus on. He tells us what to give our lives to, and he tells us how to live. I wanna pray for our time this morning, and, and then we're gonna dive into to what Micah has to say. Will you pray, pray with me? Father, we are so grateful for this morning. Father, we are grateful for the cool weather that you have brought our way, for the rain to water our lands. Father, I pray for this morning, Lord, that as we are here, God, that you would help us to focus on you, that we would, that we would listen to you, Lord. Open up our minds, open up our hearts to hear what you wanna to say to us this morning, God. I, I pray for the distractions that are, that are gonna tempt us to be focusing on something other than you, God. I pray that we would set those aside. God, for the next 20 or so minutes, Lord, that we would focus entirely on you and what you wanna to say to us this morning. We pray this in the name of Jesus, amen. Micah 6, 8. This is our main text for today. And this is what he says. He says, no, O people, this is what the Lord has told you. And this is what is good. And this is what he requires of you to do what is right, to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. The Lord has told you what is good. Now we spend a lot of time hoping that things will turn out well in our lives. We invest a lot of emotional energy in wondering if what we're doing is gonna work out for our good. And what God is saying here is, is, look, people, stop doing the things that have no guarantee. Stop doing the things that have no return on your life. Invest in what I'm about to tell you. And regardless of what your life looks like, regardless of what your situation is currently, invest in these three things and your life will be better than it is right now. Do what is right. Love mercy and walk humbly with your God. Now, at first, these sound like three separate commands, you know, three different uh, check items on a list. And although they're separated by commas on a page, they are inseparable. They are each a part of each other. You cannot have one without the other. They all feed into each other. And the Lord has told us what is good. And this is what he requires of us, to do what is right, to love mercy, to walk humbly. I wanna take a look at each of these three statements this morning to, to help us understand how they can be the key to unlocking why we're investing so much in our life and yet getting so little back. God wants us to experience the benefits of walking with him. So getting started with the first statement, we need to do what is right. Do what is right. Now in Micah's days, the religious leaders, they had become more invested in looking spiritual than actually being spiritual. They had become more distracted by, by appearing more like they had all their religious activities in a, in a row than they were actually focusing on doing what God was commanding them to do. And as a result, many of God's people were hurting. Many of God's people were being taken advantage of. See, they loved the idea of right, but they didn't practice it. Proverbs 21 verse three says, the Lord is more pleased when we do what is right and just than when we just offer him sacrifices. See, not doing what is right according to the world's standards, but what's right according to God's standard. Not treating people according to the world's system of values, but treating people justly according to the value that God has given people. This is what pleases God. And in Psalms 34, verse 14, it tells us to turn away from evil, to do what is right, strive for peace and promote it. We must turn away from evil and, and turn toward doing what is right. See, our natural selfish inclinations will always drive us away from what God wants. We must choose against that inclination. The Bible also tells us in James chapter four and verse seven, it says, anyone who knows the right thing to do, but does not do it is sinning. Anyone who knows the right thing to do, but then chooses against that and, and, and chooses to follow my natural selfish inclination is sinning. Now, as a Christ follower, I often have a sense of what I should do. I have a sense of how I should respond. I have a sense of how I should relate to my children, my wife, the people in my life. But when I am frustrated, when I, when I am irritated, when I am discouraged, I don't wanna do what's right. I don't want to follow what God has asked me to do. I want to give in to my selfish inclination. I want to do what I feel like is going to bring me happiness. See, doing what's right 
is always gonna require loving someone in a way that will cost you something. Maybe my time, my resources, my emotion, my effort. Maybe I need to sacrifice my plans, maybe my desires. See, when you feel the tension, when you feel the tension between your selfless inclinations and God's desires, pause. Pause long enough and just ask God, God, in this moment, what is the right thing to do here? And will you help me to do it? God, what is the right thing to do here? My children are fighting and throwing a fit. God, what is the right thing to do here? Because if left up to myself as an inclination, I'm gonna come in harsh. I'm gonna come in, I'm gonna come in hard. God, what's the right thing to do? And then will you help me do it? Galatians 6, 9 and 10 says, and let us not get tired of doing what is right. For after a while, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we do not get discouraged and give up. That's why whenever we can, we should always be kind to everyone, especially to our brothers in Christ. See, blessings come when we do what's right. But those blessings, they're not immediate. You know, that's why we must not get discouraged and give up. I mean, everybody would be doing what's right if the blessing came immediately. But you see, we do what's right, but we're still mistreated. We do what's right, but we still feel unloved. We do what's right, but we don't see anything about our situation changing. But we must hang in, we must hang in there. We must not get discouraged and give up because blessing is coming. Now, we have four children, like I said, so naturally, pizza is a common dinner item for us. And I want you to picture it like this, okay? It's getting close to dinner time. You know that you need to feed your kids. You know what happens if you don't feed your kids. They turn into some like savage monsters, right? So you know that you gotta feed them. So you order a pizza. You order a pizza, the pizza's, you know, you're gonna have it delivered, you make the call, you order it, and they tell you it's gonna be delivered in 30 to 45 minutes, which we all know is somewhere between like an hour and an hour and a half. So now you're waiting, and it just seems like it is taking forever. I mean, the kids keep asking, Dad, when's the pizza gonna come? Dad, when's the pizza gonna come? Did you order cheese? Right? You're hungry, they're hungry. You start to wonder if you're gonna even make it till the pizza comes. And you get tempted to give in. You open up the pantry and you find a stale tortilla left over from taco night. And you begin to convince yourself, this may be my last meal <laughs> because pizza may never come. And you convince yourself, the pizza's never gonna come, so why keep waiting? And you end up trading the blessing of a warm, delicious pizza for a cold, stale tortilla. See, just because you don't see the blessings coming doesn't mean that they aren't on their way. When you ordered the pizza, it put into a series of actions, steps that eventually result in a blessing arriving at your front door. See, waiting doesn't mean that nothing's happening. Just because you can't see it doesn't mean that it's not on its way. You just don't get the blessing until it arrives at your doorstep. So hang in there. Don't get discouraged. Do what is right. For after a while, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up and get discouraged. The Lord has told us what is good. And this is what he requires of us, to do what is right. And second, to love mercy. Now, loving mercy is the next thing that God requires us to do. Now, with the first statement, we are told to do what is right, not just love the idea of it. But this time, God flips the script. He tells us that we must love mercy, not just do it. And you see that command to love mercy, it pierces Right? It pierces to the condition of the human heart. It is far more demanding to love mercy than to just show it from time to time. And in Matthew 9, chapter, or in Matthew 9, chapter 9, verse 13, Jesus makes this statement. He says, now go and learn the meaning of this scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. You see, when the preservation of self-interest 
is the underlying goal between, behind all our desires. God's command to love mercy strikes right at the core of our self-righteousness. You cannot love mercy without loving people. Now, we might be able to get away with telling people that, you know, we love doing what's right. You know, I don't know many of us in this room that wouldn't say that we value doing what's right, but then we can kind of get away with not really doing it. But it's very difficult to say that you love mercy and then for people to only know you as being harsh, defensive, or impatient. See, I want to let you in on something. I have weaknesses. Feels really good to get that off. I have weaknesses. But guess what? So do you. You have weaknesses. But we all have one weakness. You may be thinking, I don't have anything in common with anybody. Well, here's the truth. You actually have this in common with every single person that's ever existed. We all get frustrated at each other's weaknesses. That's why we have to love mercy. (laughs) Because I have a weakness. And I'm sure my weakness frustrates you. And you have weaknesses. And I'm tempted to let those weaknesses frustrate me. We must love mercy. And like doing what's right, loving mercy is costly. It's always going to require loving people in a way that places their needs, their interests, their goals and desires ahead of mine. We cannot love mercy and love self-interest at the same time. So what does it look like? What what does loving mercy actually look like on a day-to-day basis? Proverbs 3, starting in verse 3, puts it this way. Never let loyalty and kindness leave you. Tie them around your neck as a reminder. Write them deep within your heart. Then you'll find favor with both God and people and you will earn a good reputation. You see, mercy can be defined by the two words, loyalty and kindness. Mercy is showing a loyal kindness toward others. See, I'm loyal to you. That means that I believe in you. I choose to think the best of you. I'm on your team. And kindness, kindness means that I relate to you in such a way that I build you up. I don't tear you down. Even when I'm, I'm giving critique, even when I'm giving correction, I do that in such a way that I don't tear you down. See, I have a loyal kindness toward you. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter four, starting in verse one through three says, therefore I, a prisoner of, for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling for you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowances for each other's faults because of your love and make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. See, to lead a life worthy of your calling as a Christ follower, it's to love mercy. And these these verses in Ephesians 4, they're simply an exposition on the meaning of mercy. Always be humble and gentle. That's mercy. Be patient with each other. That's mercy. Make allowances for each other's faults. Again, mercy. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit. Mercy, mercy, mercy. And I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking right now, but they don't deserve it. They don't deserve my mercy. And you are probably right. They probably don't. But then again, neither do you. See, loving mercy has nothing to do with the deservingness of the person to whom you are showing mercy to. It has everything to do with the God who calls you to lead a life worthy of your calling. 1 Peter 3, verses 8 and 9 goes on to define mercy further. Peter writes, summing it up, be agreeable, be sympathetic, be loving, be compassionate, be humble. That goes for all of you, no exceptions, no retaliation, no sharp-tongued sarcasm. Instead, bless. That's your job, to bless. You'll be a blessing, and you'll also get a blessing. See, ultimately, The goal of loving mercy is to bless others. But blessing begets blessing. 
Does that sound familiar? You remember just a few moments ago, we looked at Galatians 6, verses 9 and 10, and I just want to recap it. It said, and let us not get tired of doing what is good, for after a while we will reach a harvest of blessing if we do not give up and get discouraged. But the second half goes on to say, it says, and that's why whenever we can, we should always be kind to everyone, especially to our Christian brothers. You see, doing what's right will always require loving mercy. You cannot love mercy without doing what's right. You cannot do what's right without loving mercy. But there's one more requirement. There's one more ingredient to make this work, and that is we must walk humbly with God. See, God desires that we rely fully on him and his wisdom. Instead of seeking our own way and doing what's right in our own eyes, we must walk humbly with God. Now, Psalms 25 Verses eight and nine tells us that the Lord is good and he does what is right. He shows the proper path to those who go astray. He leads the humble in doing right, teaching them his way. Now, no one can do what God requires until they first come to God in humility as sinners who are genuinely broken. See, the only people that God can save are people who know that they are lost and need a savior. See, the only people that God can pardon are people who know that they are guilty and need forgiveness. See, when we finally see ourselves as as God sees us, then in faith, we can accept his grace. We can accept his forgiveness. We can become who God wants us to become. And we can do what God wants us to do. Now, going back to James, in James chapter four, verse six, he writes, and he gives grace generously. And as the scriptures say, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. God gives grace to the humble. See, to walk humbly with God is to walk in a life full of grace, full of his mercy, full of his forgiveness. In Proverbs 22, verse four, it says, the reward for humility and the fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. In Proverbs 21, 21, 21, it tells us that whoever pursues righteousness and mercy, aka the two things we just talked about, doing what is right, loving mercy, whoever pursues righteousness and mercy will find life, righteousness and honor. See, the key to walking humbly is found in two things. It's found in an attitude of repentance and in a posture of dependence an attitude of repentance and a posture of dependence. So you see, repentance, repentance is coming to the point where you are truly, genuinely broken over your sin. You don't just see sin as something that God doesn't like from time to time, but it's okay if you kind of do it because he'll love you anyway. You are actually broken over it. You actually see sin as something in your life that keeps you from experiencing God's grace and it breaks you. Are you broken and desperately wanting to be restored? Are you broken and desperately wanting a change in your life? Are you broken and desperately in need of a savior? That is repentance. In Isaiah chapter 66, verse two, God says, I, myself, I, God, created the whole universe and I am pleased with those who are humble and repentant who fear me and obey me. See, what God is saying is look around. Look around. I created the whole universe. Everything in it that you can see, everything you can't see, every star and galaxy, it is all mine. And yet what pleases me, what brings me joy is when one is humble and repentant, when one realizes that they are broken and they are in need of a savior. See, are you truly broken over the sin in your life? We must have an attitude of repentance, but we must also have a posture of dependence. See, all too often we live independent, one word. We must learn to live in dependence, two words. We must live in a dependent posture before the Lord, trusting and relying on God to meet our needs and to provide our joy. 
See, Jesus describes what a dependent posture looks like in Matthew chapter 11, starting in verse 28. It says that, then Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you. Now, what Jesus was referring to here is the practice of training a younger bull to be able to pull wagons and other farming equipment. And what, what farmers would do to train a young bull is they would yoke it to an older, stronger, more experienced bull. Now, the young bull, he, he would fight against the yoke. He would fight against the other bull, but the older bull is stronger. He's not shaken off course by the younger bull's impatience. But what the younger bull doesn't realize is that the older bull is also bearing most of the load until that young bull is able to pull more of the weight. See, what Jesus is saying is, is come to me, all of you who are weary. Come to me, all of you who are carrying heavy burdens. He asks, are you tired of carrying the load all by yourself? Let me carry it for you. Yoke yourself with me. Depend on me and I will give you rest for your soul for my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. God wants to carry the burden. He wants to carry the load. Walk humbly with God and let him carry it with you. Where are you this morning? Are you broken over your sin? Have you been weighed down and, and carrying a load that's never been yours to carry alone? God is ready to save. He is ready to forgive. He is ready to restore. He is ready to lift the load off your shoulders. I encourage you this morning, give your life to Jesus. Trust him. His burden is light. And in the words of Micah 6, 8, the Lord has told you what is good. And this is what he requires of you, to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Where has God spoken to you this morning? What promises has he given you to claim? What area of your life has he prompted you to change? Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you so much for the words that you have given to us in your scriptures. Father, I pray that you would help us to obey you. Father, I pray that we would be changed, that we wouldn't just go home today and, and nothing change about who we are, but Father, that we would leave today changed from the inside out. God, that we would leave today closer to you than when we came. God, I pray that we would desire to do what is right. Father, that we would love mercy. God, that we would walk humbly with you with an attitude of repentance and a posture of dependence. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We pray all this in the name of Christ who makes it possible. Amen. And when you came in this morning, you're given a program and inside that program is a connect card. And we wanna encourage you right now to fill that card out. If you haven't filled out the front side, just put your name on it. Let us know how we can reach out to you. But on the back side, take some time. Let us know how God has spoken to you. Maybe your next step is to invite Christ into your life for the first time. Maybe you've realized here this morning that you've been carrying that load your whole life. But Jesus stands at the door and he's willing to take the yoke. Maybe you need to invite Christ into your life for the first time. Maybe you need to take, get baptized and follow through in your commitment to Christ. Let us know how God is encouraging this morning and how we can pray for you. We thank you so much.
Let's all stand together. Father to the fatherless, defender of the weak, freedom for the prisoner, we sing. This is God. See
your voice Even in the distance And even in the silence Even in the static And I see you move Even in the dark night Even in the half light And even in the stillness And after the fire And after the wind When chaos subsides I listen again And after the earth shakes You're calling me in A voice in the quiet A whisper within When you speak
so good. Thank you guys so much for being here, for worshiping with us. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. See you all next week.